our next session will be equally interesting. It is all about modeling uh, the security blankets we use to try and understand complexity and delighted that to, to chair this is uh, the wonderful Alison Pollock, uh, clinical professor of public health at Newcastle University. So Alison, can you make yourself known to us? I hope you can see me. I can now, yeah. yes, beautiful, oh, how are you? Yeah, fantastic, this has been a marvellous day, fantastic sessions and speakers. So thanks to the BMJ and George for organising it. Well, rolling on to modelling and everybody's uh, kept to time. Um, Phil, I can see your picture, so I don't know whether that means people can't see me. Um, what we have... I was going to hand over to you to introduce your panel, so I'm going to go into the background now. <laughs> okay. I could still see you, but... Um... Alison, we can see you fine. Okay, we can see fine. You. Yeah. okay, so this is a really important uh, session, this session on modelling. And as you will all remember, back in February, we had Prof Ferguson, the spectre of 400,000 deaths, ambulances piling up in hospitals, ITU in hospital beds, overflowing with patients not getting in. And that was what finally triggered the UK decision to lock down on the 23rd of March. But within a day of that paper being published, um, modelers in uh, John Hopkins University had already highlighted that the modeling had failed to take account of non-pharmaceutical interventions. And indeed, one of the great puzzles for us in public health was why the government waited to lock down. We had hand washing, but we didn't have all the other control measures in place, travel, quarantine, testing, uh, et cetera. And what we've seen is the gradual um, increase in all these non-pharmaceutical interventions, plus of course, the erosion of our civil liberties. And then of course, culminating in tears and lockdown. So I'm delighted that we're going to have Dr. Adam Kucharski, Associate Professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine Professor, um, uh, uh, introducing the effects of interventions, where he's looking at these questions as what role non-pharmaceutical interventions such as contact tracing and testing and social distancing play. In our second uh, talk, we have this, uh, a really interesting one on immunity. And of course, nowhere has the debate been more polarized, apart from masks, over herd immunity and also zero COVID. And there's been a lot of ignorance about herd immunity and its relevance in respect to vaccination, but also in respect to naturally acquired immunity. So it's really fantastic. We've got Dr. Gabriela Gomez, who's going to educate us on this, along with Professor Mark Lipsitch, who will follow on the long-term prospects looking at perhaps T-cell immunity, among other things. So let's kick off now. Adam, you have 15 minutes and I'll try and keep you to time, if you can't, um, on the effects of interventions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you to the organizers for um, a fascinating day uh, so far. Um, so I'll talk about the, the effects of interventions. Um, and given I'm doing this, uh, I thought it'd be good to start with uh, this schematic um, that's from a paper from Christoph Fraser and colleagues uh, post SARS. I think it nicely illustrates a couple of the dimensions um, that really uh, influence our ability to, to contain these kinds of infections with um, traditional contact tracing. So isolating people with symptoms, tracing their co uh, contacts and quarantining them. And on the vertical here, you've got the reproduction number. So for, for each infectious case, how much secondary infection do they generate on average? Along the bottom, you've got the proportion of infections that are generated by people without symptoms, so either asymptomatic or, um, or before they, they have onset. And when you move through this diagram, when you move from one corner where you've got uh, sort of low transmission, most of the infection comes from people with symptoms, which is relatively easy to contain, to a situation with higher transmission and far more transmission without symptoms, uh, it becomes much harder. And it's really a key early question was where does um, this new coronavirus sit within this picture? I think we now have a clear idea from, from various studies that are emerging that um, it probably sits somewhere between flu and SARS in terms of its, um, its characteristics. So we, we're obviously seeing more potential for transmission without symptoms, um, probably slightly higher transmissibility uh, than for seasonal flu. 
but illustrates the kind of challenge of, of control. And I think people sometimes talk about a SARS strategy or flu strategy, but really it's a spectrum of, of effectiveness and, and the new virus seems to land somewhere on this threshold. Um, but of course, in the early stages, working out where this was, um, was, was really a key question, one that we were working on um, from January. And one of the benefits of models is it allows you to lay out these different delays, um, the, the different kind of biological processes, the testing process, the timing uh, to trace contacts, the proportion you might trace. Um, you can make plausible assumptions about transmissions. You can look at um, average behavior. You can look at sort of super spreading potential. And then in this quite simple model, um, look at the implications of, of different factors for control. So we looked at a whole number during this, this early period because of course, um, there was very little data to, to give us confidence what some of these values might be. But a crucial one I'm displaying here is this transmission before symptoms. We looked at this range from mostly symptomatic to one where there's about 30%, which actually on some studies is perhaps slightly optimistic even. But you can see this bottom uh, line here with 30%, that when you have that much transmission before symptoms, really you need to be tracing a high proportion of, of contacts under plausible assumptions about what you might be doing in terms of testing. Um, and detection. So it really kind of does present a challenge uh, in terms of uh, ensuring control just through this kind of um, tracing of symptomatic cases and quality of contacts. So a number of countries um, have, well, pretty much all of them have introduced additional measures um, alongside this, uh, in particular social distancing. And one of the most extensive versions of this uh, was what we saw in, in Wuhan in late January, early on. Um, really kind of substantial at the time un unprecedented in terms of um, this lockdown and in hindsight it's it's pretty straightforward to see what happened to the case data um, in terms of the turnaround and the peak shortly after this was introduced um, in this period uh, in, in late January but at the time it was actually quite challenging uh, to work out if it had peaked and because of uncertainties in the data coming in um, because of delays because of underreporting, uh, and we did some work trying to synthesize various available data sets. And we, we found clear evidence of this decline. But even during that period, there was quite a lot of uncertainty about how reliable that signal was. And one reason is just in real time, case data changes, it's delayed. Um, you can get backfilling where cases are kind of reported retrospectively. And I think this paper is a nice illustration of how the, even just the case definition changes. And depending on the different case definitions used during this period, you actually get quite different epidemic curves and different peaks. So your conclusions about the epidemic and the effects of control will be different depending on which data you rely on. Uh, so a lot of early modeling, there was really a value to using multiple data sources. So we did um, a number of other groups as well, not just looking at the raw case data, but looking at things like exported cases to get an indication of the growth and extent of transmission locally. Um, and things like uh, testing on evacuation flights to get a measure of perhaps the background prevalence and how much um, additional infection might be out there. Um, being under ascertained. And these kinds of data sets aren't just important um, for analysis of, of kind of the transmission dynamics, it's also crucial um, for estimating things like severity. Of course, if you want to look at the impact of control measures, you need to know the impact of your epidemic. Um, what is it going to potentially be doing in terms of hospitalizations, deaths, metrics that you might want to reduce through control? So it's a key thing that, um, that many modeling groups worked on, using additional data. So all these were kind of early March studies, two, two studies using this prevalence on evacuation flights to try and get at this under ascertainment. So, you know, how much of this is iceberg uh, of kind of cases and um, severe disease are you seeing? And then we did some work using intensive testing from Diamond Princess. But you can see that the estimates for symptomatic fatality risk and um, all infection fatality risk actually come out pretty consistent. And these are, are, are broadly consistent with what we've subsequently seen in serological data. So I think really illustrates the value of trying to make as much use of you as you can with these early data sources and using models as a way of uh, extracting those insights from that kind of quite patchy early information. When you have um, this, this kind of severity estimates and when you have those insights into what transmission might be doing and MPIs might be doing, um, you can then use transmission models obviously to bring together that information. There's lots of different models out there, but broadly the sort of structure we have is um, you'll bring in knowledge about the epidemiology, so perhaps transmission, delays in biological processes, um, some kind of social mixing structure, um, very common for respiratory infections to structure by age, by um, setting in particular as well, because you'll see variation in contacts and transmission intensity there. 
incorporate this information into a transmission model where you have some mixing between people who are susceptible and infectious and that in turn generates more infections. And then generally we'll have some model of burden. So you have infections within the population, but then you have some model that can translate those infections into things like cases, hospitalizations, beds in use or, or other metrics that you'll be um, particularly interested in. And then in turn, um, this is some early work that we did looking at quite relatively light interventions over a short period, but then you can simulate from this model and see what the impact might be. Now, of course, uncertainty in any parameter or process that goes into to any one of these parts of the model will influence the results. But I think it's important to be aware that the uncertainty won't always act in the same way. So, for example, if you um, have a, a hospitalization risk that's, that's twice as high, then that will just scale your curve of hospitalizations linearly, essentially double it, or what it would be in terms of admissions. Whereas if you have an estimate of transmissibility that's actually twice as high, that will scale a reproduction number. And that's often an exponential growth process. So that won't scale your outbreak linearly. That will have a massive impact on your conclusion about the epidemic. So often those uncertainties, um, although people sometimes focus on specific parameters, they focus less on actually some of these uncertainties have much bigger impacts than others. Now, of course, when we did this early work, a lot of this late Feb, early March, um, there hadn't been major outbreaks in a lot of areas of Europe. So we're obviously um, sort of projecting forward. Now though, because these epidemics have happened, it's possible to fit these models uh, to available data. And you can in turn use the dynamics you observe to, to refine your assumptions about the epidemiology, about social behavior effects of, of interventions. But one of the big challenges of doing this is understanding what's shaped the outbreak that you see. Um, and it's really a question of, of identifiability. It's a problem that we can have a single data set but multiple explanations for it. And from that single data set, we can't distinguish. So this is just a very, very simple transmission model I've put together, um, almost a cartoon model. But there's four different sets of, uh, of model structures and assumptions here. So each one of these is a different model, but I've calibrated these models to generate identical uh, outputs. So in the first two models, um, we've got something that ends with basically with herd immunity. So the first model is one where Everyone starts off susceptible. You've got a kind of modest transmission rate and um, no interventions, goes through the population and, and you get acquired immunity. The second model is one where there's quite a bit of pre-existing immunity. So there's a higher transmission rate assumed to overcome this. You get some accumulation of immunity and in turn that brings the epidemic down. Um, in the bottom models, we're assuming, again, different assumptions about transmission, slightly different assumptions about reporting. But in this case, we've got a model where in one contacts, um, reduce and this in turn is what the, causes the, the declines there's not a huge um, accumulation of immunity and then in the final plot contacts don't change but the risk per contact changes perhaps by some seasonal effect and that's what what leads to the reduction so it's you know very much a kind of broad schematic these are kind of very simplistic models but just an illustration that if you just look at these curves you can actually have multiple models that will generate similar patterns so how can we work out what control might be doing well, there's a couple of main approaches we can use. One is to just look at the association between the dynamics we see in the outbreak and the implications of, of control. So um, Gabriel earlier um, gave a, a, a very nice talk referring to this. Um, this in, in Hong Kong, you've got changes in the reproduction number, and then you've got when these different uh, measures were introduced. So working from home, um, strict interventions. And as Gabriel mentioned, it also gives a, a sort of idea of the upper bound of mask effectiveness, because you had very high um, mask usage, but an, a reproduction number that crept up to around two. So that gives you a sense of, of potential impact it may have been having. But there's a couple of challenges with this kind of associational approach. One is just how to calculate your reproduction number. Uh, this work some, by, by some colleagues of mine showing that if you use case data or hospitalizations or deaths, even if you adjust for the various delays in those data, because each of those data sets is capturing transmission in a slightly different component of your population, you may not get the same conclusions about R. So is that, that issue of, well, what do we actually mean by current transmission? What do we want to do to measure it? Another major issue um, in Europe is just the timing of interventions. In, in March, most interventions went in within about a week or two, which given the various kind of lags and smoothing effects you get in the data, makes it very hard to actually discern which of these had exactly what effect. I think in some areas of Europe, we're only actually seeing um, as measures are relaxed and schools reopen, for example, 
um, some sense of what impact on transmission uh, the, these things are, are actually having in reality. Another approach though, if, if there's limits to just do, doing this kind of associational approach is to measure social contacts directly. So this is work by some colleagues of mine comparing um, contact, social contact intensity um, before COVID. So this was just an existing study and then post lockdown. So a couple of days after the March lockdown and building that into a quite a simple model to get an overall estimate of transmission of the population. They came to the conclusion that based on conversational contacts, this darker region here, they could be pretty confident the R value was below one. So as you can see, quite a lot of uncertainty there, um, but really it suggested that that dramatic change in contact was enough to reduce transmission. And then subsequently that showed up in other data sets. Um, and th these studies have been, have been running every week since. Um, and the red dots here show the inferred um, reproduction number from social mixing. And then overlaid is the, the React data. So Helen talked about this uh, earlier, so this community sampling of, of infections. And you can see that the, the estimates of growth are reasonably consistent. So contacts which are, are giving a kind of mechanistic idea of, of interactions that drive transmission give a reasonably consistent patterns with what we see um, in the testing data. Um, I think the final thing though to be aware of when we're talking about transmission is this heterogeneity and this, this role of chance particularly in low numbers. Um, as, as Michael mentioned in, in his nice talk, um, in New Zealand a very small, relatively small proportion of initial introduced infections actually led to sustained transmission. And this is completely consistent on the left with what we'd expect with um, a virus that transmits like, like SARS-CoV-2, that, that actually if you have small numbers of introductions, it's quite unlikely that one of those will lead to an outbreak. But somewhat paradoxically with super spreading um, is that if it does cause an outbreak, you get a much larger one. I think Iceland is a, a recent example where you have very low numbers over time, really sustained control, and then um, a quarantine that was, was, was not um, adhered to and then suddenly you've got a large number of cases to deal with so sometimes it may be and I think this is a situation we had in Europe quite low numbers for a prolonged period of time giving the impression that the current control was less than one minute to go I've got one side so thank you um, uh, so giving the impression of control but that might not actually um, be the reality so really getting back to the, I think the theme of today what are the unknowns that, that might be important for control I think one um, as we as we heard earlier, I think in Lucy's talk about the role of asymptomatic transmission, particularly around schools. We know there's you know that a primary school child is not the same as an 18 year old. Understanding their contribution, I think, is crucial. I think immunity is going to be increasingly important as a number of countries get um, reproduction number down to around one. So perhaps measures that might have got R down to around 1.1, 1.2 at the start of the year because of accumulated immunity may now be seeing declining transmission, and that's going to create additional variation to think about obviously non-policy behavior change. So people will change behavior in response to an outbreak. Adherence will change. It won't be the same now as it was earlier in the year, but this will be crucial, I think, over the coming months in influencing things. And then finally, I'm, I'm sure Mark will talk more about this, um, vaccine characteristics. What do they do? How do they impact transmission? And how do they interact with other MPIs? So I'll leave it there and thank you. Thanks very much. That was fantastic, um, Adam. Really marvelous talk. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Can I now hand over to Dr. Gabriela gomez fleet who's the Professor of Mathematics Statistics at the University of Strathclyde. Welcome, Gabriela. I, so I'm sharing my screen. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having, I just can't, I'm trying to share my screen. Good time. Is, is it? No. Yeah, it's starting. It's starting. I don't you can see your computer. Ah, it's a sorry. very busy computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry about this. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's great. It, yeah, it's a great opportunity to be here and a pleasure. So, I, I'm going to talk about the implications of heterogeneity for COVID transmission. Uh, so, I, I'm, I have uh, some names here of colleagues, collaborators who joined us. So uh, uh, there's been a lot of resistance to our work, but we also have been fortunate to have colleagues joining efforts with us. And, and these are the current colleagues working on it with their groups. So uh, our model, we, we, it, it's just a, a standard SEIR model, and, and we include the, the individual variation to it. Individual variation is represented by this little X here. So individuals, susceptible individuals, 
individuals, they, they are susceptible with susceptibility X. So that, that gives that differentiation. And of course, the individuals uh, have their uh, um, uh, the, 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 their susceptibility multiplied by this factor X that affects the force of infection. So individuals with more susceptibility, they, they are more likely to be infected early in the epidemic and therefore removed from susceptible pool as they recover with some degree of immunity. And as a result, the susceptibility, the individuals who remain susceptible in susceptible pool are those that have lower, had lower susceptibility or all along. So this makes the, the average susceptibility of the susceptible population to reduce over time, and it leads to epidemics to be smaller than a homogeneous model would have suggested. So um, we, we do two versions of this model. One is, is variable susceptibility, so heterogeneity and susceptibility, as I described. And another one is, is heterogeneity in exposure due to heterogeneous contacts. Uh, con uh, contacts. Um, and and the, they work very similarly. The results, the, the selection uh, process that I described works with, with both of these uh, model variants. So what results do we get? So for Europe, we apply this model to uh, uh, data from European countries. Here I'm showing Belgium and England, and, and I'm showing the, the, the cases um, until, uh, until June, mid-June, late June in, in these two countries. And the model, uh, so we fitted the model to this case data and, uh, and using a, a reporting rate that we uh, estimated from data on, on, on seroprevalences as well as cases. Uh, and we, we, took, we took those reporting rates into account to fit the case data. And, and then we just kept simulating uh, what, what would happen to we'll get an idea of, of what we had ahead in terms of epidemic dynamics. So, so this is Belgium and this is what we saw for England and with, with the heterogeneous susceptibility model. And this is with the heterogeneous connectivity model. And, and we estimated parameters like are, are not, uh, five, we estimated five in Belgium, two point something in England, and coefficients of variation about uh, one point something, three point something, so they vary from country to country, um, uh, and, and then we estimate uh, that then we, we could calculate the, the herd immunity thresholds, which is when do we have enough immunity in the population to uh, prevent future outbreaks. Um, and, uh, and, and we estimated these values to be about 10 to 20 something percent, um, again, depending on country. Um, and, and, uh, and then we compared them with homogeneous, what a homogeneous model would have said, and I'll show that next. We also had interventions here uh, simplified, uh, of course. So, so we, we assume that the, the effect of non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, it, intensifies over time. So that is, he is represented here multiplying R0. So the, the contact as contacts decrease, R0 decreases. And then you get to some plateau where uh, contacts are at the minimum, which would be typical, typically during a lockdown. And then uh, as lockdown is, is Relax is really is relaxed. Measures are lockdown is lifted. Measures are relaxed. Contacts start to uh, resume, and are are not uh, or these controls are not increases uh, again towards towards the baseline. Um, and and we didn't impose what we we, we, we in, these were part of the param the parameters that we estimated the maximum intensity of the intervention, and this slope of of relaxing interventions towards to, towards normal, so in Belgium and, and in England uh, as well, um, and and uh, you of course as as Adam mentioned, it's it's difficult to separate these these effects. It's separate. You you can get different models giving very different uh, epidemic curves, um, and and uh, and then we, we just have to look for. Uh, extra data to convince ourselves so we can convince others that uh, what we what our fitting uh, 
uh, algorithm is identifying as the, the, the most likely set of parameters is actually agrees with other data, that, that other data types. And here is data from measured contacts like the Polymod um, project, the generated data that many people use was kind of one landmark in this kind of study. Um, where they measure contacts by questionnaires, people just filling a, fill a diary saying how many contacts they had each day. And this distribution of contacts uh, was constructed uh, the, the, again for Europe and for Belgium. The, the, this is you know, it's a Belgium study, again, where we had this distribution um, of contacts. When we compare with our distributions, we, this is fitting a gamma distribution. I, I forgot to say we use the gamma distribution in these particular uh, fits. Uh, here, we, we just confirm that the gamma distribution does fit this kind of data. And the coefficients of variation would be uh, this, uh, so a bit less than ours coefficient of variation of 0.9 as opposed to 1.5 or 6 for 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 in uh, for for well for in, in general for 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 the the set of countries that the european countries that participated in this polymod study and for belgium uh, again 1.5 uh, as opposed to 3. Point something so it's not surprising that uh, this kind of um, studies measure less variation than what we capture here, because this is only one of the sources of variation. It's contacts, but there's all the biological susceptibility as well that accounts for this variation. So if we come to the conclusion that contact heterogeneity explains half of the variation we estimate, I find that quite plausible, and that the other half is due to biological heterogeneity. So we were quite pleased to, to, to see this. Um, um, yeah, to, to, to see this uh, concordance, I, I think. Uh, when, when we look at the homogeneous model, these are the, the, the equivalent fits when we force coefficient of variation to be zero. And, and you see, uh, of course, the, 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 the epidemics are much larger, as I, uh, as I said. And, and it looks like the, you know, this model has a lot great difficulty estimating the slope uh, at which um, measures are, are, are lifted, are, uh, measures are relaxed, because as, as a way, uh, you know, in a way, it looks like this model just can, can't decide if, if it's better to stay in lockdown forever or not. It's just like, it, it, cannot, it, it cannot really um, let it go, let, let, you know, it, it cannot estimate this, this ramp of lifting interventions. And as a result, you have this huge uncertainty. The, the herd immunity thresholds are much larger here at around 60, 70%. The, and the effect of the interventions is stronger to, to yeah to make up for the lack of, of heterogeneity that, that uh, increases the, 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 the impact of acquired immunity. And here is model comparison criteria applying to, to the, the, we actually applied it to four models. We had homogeneous model, the heterogeneous model. We, we had a basic heterogeneous connectivity model that uh, wasn't the, the, the best. We, the, the, this one in red is the one I've showed in the previous slide is a heterogeneous connectivity model that that takes into account some kind of rewiring it allows for during lockdown the coefficient of variation decreases during lockdown and then it increases again uh, after lockdown is is lifted and 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 we you we see the, the the best model was the heterogeneous susceptibility the second best according to this uh, uh, archaic information criterion is the this uh, dynamic contact patterns um, for both Belgium and England. We did the same thing for Brazil, uh, just to show again, the, uh, not without going into details. So we see uh, Manaus and Fortaleza, we see that the home, the, these are the fits by, of the, the heterogeneous model, heterogeneous susceptibility. And here with homogeneous models, we see much larger second waves. Um, much larger herd immunity thresholds. And here are the herd immunity thresholds for the, the different countries or cities we analyzed. We see these values. So, so you, you can actually derive a formula for the herd immunity threshold as a function of R0 and coefficient of variation. As, as the coefficient of variation increases, uh, 
herd immunity threshold drops initially quite steeply and then, and, and then it stays uh, uh, um, sort of more between 10% between and 20-30% uh, for uh, the, the range of coefficients of variation that we have estimated. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, you know, we, you, we'd like to go forward and, and your question that we are constantly being asked is how does it perform with more recent data? The problem with more recent data is that the tests increased so steeply that, that and, and, and it became that, that second waves, the size of second waves is not really easily comparable to the size of the first waves. So we, we should look at mortality data uh, if, if we want to simulate the models and fit the models to longer time series. And, and as we tried to do that, um, we found that the, the, the uh, yeah, of course, there, there was this decrease in infection fatality ratio. So our, our model had actually predicted more mortality than it's actually happened, the happening for England. So we see, uh, we, we had to add seasonality if, if we want to, uh, uh, this to look any anywhere like the, the actual time series without without seasonality we would have this dotted uh, orange curve including seasonality we have the dotted uh, black curve with the parameters we estimated and and we, so we we are, we are actually predicting by fitting to that case data we our model actually predicts more mortality than it's actually happening so in order one of the ways to, lo to lower these, and uh, of course not the only way, again, as Adam uh, said, there's, I'm sure there, there'll be other explanations for, his, for, for this declining infection fatality ratio, but one possible one, since we are working with, a, with a, an individual that has a model that has individual variation in it, is to allow for a correlation between susceptibility and death probability. So like, like the, if the people who are more likely to become infected are also more likely to suffer the most severe outcomes of it. Or perhaps people who are exposed more intensively to the largest doses, they are also more likely to develop more severe outcomes. So that's what this kind of correlation would, uh, would, would capture. And we, we, we estimate, so we just uh, allow the simple formula for this correlation, and we estimated what kind of parameters would give the best fit to the to the mortality data, and and that led to this curve here. So using uh, using these, we then uh, simulate um, we, uh, what 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 would happen uh, after after the end of this year. So according to our model, by the end of the year, by the end of this year, the pandemic will be over. And, and, and what we have from, from then on is, is an endemic seasonal virus. Uh, and, and that's what we see here for the mortality data in black. According to the homogeneous model, we still have a lot of infection to sort out, to process the, uh, before, uh, be, be, before it becomes uh, uh, regular, like uh, uh, seasonal, causing seasonal. Gabriela, you have one minute to go. OK. And, and, and we also look, and this is not surprising at all, we also look what percentage of the population would we have to vaccinate to stop infection over the next 10 years. And, and of course, with the homogeneous model, we get a value that is close to the herd immunity threshold for homogeneous models, the 21% in this case. And according to the, to the homogeneous model, we will get, you, you need a vaccination coverage that is um, uh, close to the herd immunity threshold of the homogeneous models, which is more like 60%. And, and what, 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 what we did here was to vaccinate the individuals who were more susceptible, since those were also the more vulnerable. Uh, and it seemed to make sense and, and, and led to this um, effect. And this is my final slide. So, uh, we, so we have been writing uh, several preprints so far between us and collaborators. We have we have five preprints and none of them has been peer reviewed yet. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Gabriella. That was great. And um, I'm sure there will be questions. So I'm going to move quickly on now to Professor Mark Lipsett. Welcome, Professor of Epidemiology at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health, Boston. So um, I hope these hours are not too antisocial for you now. Thank you. No problem. It's uh, it's daytime, but I can't share until Gabriella unshares. Ah, 
great. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, and thank you, George, and to the other organizers and Fiona and others for the opportunity. Um, so I'm going to focus, I was asked to talk about the long term. And in thinking about the long term, um, I think with this epidemic, the striking thing is that uh, it's kind of a race between two fast processes, the accumulation of knowledge and the accumulation of events. Uh, and so um, I'm going to try to sort of talk about the state of that race rather than just saying what we don't know. I'm going to try to sort of put it in context and in what we're learning and what we still don't know. So um, this is our team uh, at Harvard School of Public Health that's been working uh, since February. Um, and I want to focus on um, questions related to immunity, mainly because as Gabriella uh, and, and Adam also mentioned, um, immunity is really kind of what's going to drive the long term. Um, and so I want to talk about pre-existing immunity, natural immunity from infection, and vaccine-induced immunity. Um, and then just mention uptake and global vaccine distribution, which I think are really crucial, but uh, less modeling questions uh, in some sense. So there's been an accumulation of work, most of it in the last couple of months, uh, about pre-existing immunity to SARS-CoV-2 in unexposed individuals. Um, so a very recent paper shows humoral immunity that cross-reacts to seasonal coronaviruses in people who have not had SARS-CoV-2. Um, that was in Science this month. Um, there was, uh, but there was a paper um, uh, a little before that that showed that that even when you're just thinking about head about homologous immunity, that is immunity from one seasonal coronavirus to itself, that that type of immunity is short-lived. Um, and this paper from a Dutch group um, in Nature Medicine showed that um, people were infected multiple times over a, a long period uh, of follow-up with, um, with seasonal coronaviruses inferred from serologic responses. So maybe uh, some uncertainty, but it seems that uh, this type of immunity is short-lived, um, even when it's for the virus, for the seasonal virus against the seasonal virus, but even potentially more so uh, for cross-reaction. And finally, um, then a little bit earlier work over the summer, mostly um, a lot of it from the Scripps group um, showed that there's cross-reactive immunity um, that, that uh, people who have not had SARS-CoV-2 have. So this, this is all types of pre-existing community immunity in people who are not exposed. Um, so we worked with, uh, with a group at Scripps um, to uh, try to understand what their results in the laboratory finding this T cell immunity um, uh, might imply for our understanding of, of transmission dynamics. Um, and we came to the conclusion that compared to a situation where there's no cross-reactive uh, um, memory T cells in a person shown in this first upper left figure, um, there's a possible, the, the possible scenarios um, that have reasonable biological basis are that that, that T cell immunity, you know, if it's present in a person might reduce the lung burden and therefore the symptomatology it might uh, reduce the lung burden and also accelerate the, uh, the arrival of antibodies, um, or it might uh, even shorten the duration of, uh, of infection in the upper respiratory tract due to T cell uh, resident memory activity. What, we, what the biology uh, suggests, and this is, this is obviously from the biologists, is that it's unlikely that this T cell immunity reduces susceptibility to infection. There's really no good um, model system in which that seems to be true, uh, it, especially in humans. Um, that it may play a role in disease severity and or infectiousness, but that, that that effect is baked into early epidemiologic estimates. So I think one of the confusing things is that when something is newly discovered, people somehow imagine that that means it's a new thing, uh, that, that hasn't been accounted for in the past. Um, and that might be true, but, but in this case, uh, you know, if there were people in the population who uh, lacked 
uh, who had T cells and therefore were less infectious, that would have been baked into the early epidemiologic infectiousness uh, estimates. Um, and then uh, relevant to, to what Gabriella talked about, um, her, her uh, modeling work is based on heterogeneous susceptibility, but heterogeneous infectiousness, which we do think is plausible biologically uh, based on, on T cells, uh, does not have those same dramatic effects on herd immunity thresholds. So what do we know about infection acquired immunity? Um, and that again is, uh, is rapidly evolving. This preprint from Dan et al came out, uh, I think earlier this week or last week, which suggests that uh, in following up uh, several dozen patients um, over larger, more than six months that the, their, all their arms of, of immunity typically lasted over that six month period, um, including T cells of various sorts and antibodies. Um, so those are immunologic measurements. And of course, there's the critical question when we translate into modeling terms of whether immunity, meaning evidence of exposure to infection uh, and immune response translates into resistance to future infection. Um, and so the functional significance of all of this remains unclear, whether it's immunity to infection, uh, to disease only, or to shedding, um, even if someone becomes infected. Um, and the, the data on, on the critical thing from the, from the modeling perspective, which is infection and shedding, um, is, is still quite limited. Um, we, we've seen uh, very widely publicized evidence uh, of individual cases where, where people were negative, were positive, were negative again, uh, and then became reinfected with a genetically different strain. So it's clear that reinfection can happen as it does with seasonal coronaviruses. Um, and really the, the, the studies have not yet come out to demonstrate or, or reject the notion of widespread zero protection. The best, uh, the best data I think so far comes from this uh, slightly obscure paper, but I think really beautiful paper um, that was featured in the New York Times um, where there was a, uh, a, a boat, a fishing boat that went out to sea. Antibody measurements were taken beforehand. There was a, 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 an epidemic that infected more than 80% of, of people but the three individuals who had neutralizing antibodies prior to departure all escaped that. And although uh, three is not a very large number, it actually is statistically quite unlikely that that would happen by chance. So I think that's uh, not as much evidence as we'd like, but it's, it's very promising. Um, we began looking at this question of infection-induced immunity and cross-immunity cross um, in a study that we published early on in science um, with a fairly um, structurally complicated model that just tried to consider multiple strains of beta coronaviruses and their possible cross reactions. And, um, and the, uh, the, um, the predictions were that uh, depending on when uh, restrictions, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions were relaxed, um, or, and when the when the virus was introduced, you would get um, various patterns that are shown here with uh, with varying timings, but that you would get uh, multiple waves of both the existing the new virus and, and other viruses that are closely related to it, um, and that that would det det matter would vary dramatically depending on what you assumed about the type of immunity uh, um, to SARS-CoV-2 and also cross-reactivity and seasonality. A newer paper from the group at Princeton um, uh, focuses more on the question of how, uh, of, of how immunity works. So not just whether it exists and how long it lasts, but whether uh, it reduces um, whether someone who's been previously exposed is less of a shedder, uh, as in this uh, SIR brackets S model, or is totally immune, as in this SIR model, or is totally uh, just like someone who's been previously 
uh, never infected after some period of waning. Um, and, and that can generate multiple types of behavior. And I suggest this uh, new paper in science as a, a really useful uh, consideration of, of how these uncertainties about the biology translate into uncertainties about the immunology. And then last is vaccine-induced immunity. Um, and here the, the uncertainty, which, which Adam uh, Finn mentioned in his earlier talk, I was up early because I wanted to hear uh, those talks, um, uh, is that the phase three trials are, um, have are, are what are known as event-driven endpoints, which is to say that they do their analysis after a certain number of cases have happened rather than after a certain amount of time. Um, and that's less than 200 for the, for the major trials. This means that one key question is that we, don't, we won't know with great precision the efficacy in subgroups, like those groups in particular that are, uh, that are at highest risk, because data that's sufficient for precision in the overall study is, is by definition insufficient for precision uh, in each of the subgroups. Um, we have uh, similarly uh, inadequate data from these trials and will have uh, for their efficacy against severe disease, although there's some data from the Moderna trial that's promising uh, because there were enough severe cases. Um, as has been stated, I think it was Adam and, and maybe another talk also, all the phase three trials use symptomatic confirmed disease as their endpoint, and only one of them, the Oxford one on the, on the Oxford vaccine, uh, tests for asymptomatic infection. Um, and so what that means is that we won't really know uh, what the impact of the vaccine is in reducing transmission. Um, and this is discussed on, uh, in a, a short commentary that we wrote in um, Science last month. And so one of the fascinating things is that maybe the details of that don't matter too much. And, and let me explain why. So there's some forms of uncertainty that matter more than others. And I think this does, but, there, but at, at the top line, maybe it doesn't as much as we might imagine. So as was stated in earlier talks, most of the plans initially prioritize the idea that we will vaccinate those who are at highest risk rather than employ a transmission blocking strategy. So after healthcare workers, which is a sort of separate goal of, of reciprocity and of protecting the healthcare system, after healthcare workers, most plans prioritize those with many com comorbidities um, and those in congregate settings and those who are old, who are the ones most likely to die if they get infected. This is a rational strategy when supplies and efficacy may be low. We didn't know about efficacy when these plans were being developed. Supplies will initially be low. When transmission is high, meaning that direct protection is more likely to be effective than, than trying to slow, uh, slow transmission with, the with small amounts of vaccine. Um, it's rational when, if immunogenicity data suggests the vaccine can protect high risk groups and the new data from AstraZeneca, for example, is suggestive of that, uh, that the immune response is pretty good in them. You have one minute left. Okay. And when there's uncertainty about transmission effects. So I think these are good strategies, um, but, uh, but work that we've just been doing in re response to peer reviewers uh, to revise it to revise a prioritization study suggests that uh, there's an important interaction. So this slide shows purple means it's best to immunize directly the elderly because they're the ones at high risk. And if you're trying to prevent deaths under a very wide range of assumptions, that's true. If you're trying to prevent cases, then uh, you want to reduce, you want to vaccinate the transmitters. But as we've been, um, we've been uh, revising, consider the interaction between vaccination and non-pharmaceutical interventions. So if you have a rip-roaring epidemic, then with small amounts of vaccine, you really should just vaccinate the, uh, the, those at highest risk because you're not gonna reduce transmission enough to them. But if non-pharmaceutical interventions are in place so that are not as say cut in half, then the, there are much more complicated interactions and it can be valuable even with a poorly efficacious or small amounts of vaccine to interrupt transmission. 
So I think finding out these effects on transmission are really important. Um, I think the direct vaccination of the high risk is the right strategy right now, given our uncertainties. But I think with more data, we could actually potentially refine that strategy if we knew that we could maintain non-pharmaceutical interventions and that there was a big effect of vaccination on transmission. At the moment, we don't know that. And then last, I just want to mention this uh, rather shameful um, state of the world uh, from uh, as as shown by The Economist, that Canada has 10 doses of vaccine ordered for every one of its citizens, and uh, Indonesia has less than one, and Mexico has about half, and Bangladesh has essentially zero. So um, the inequities uh, are well known, and um, we're unfortunately having very different conversations in different parts of the world. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Mark. Um, so I think because we're short of time, without more ado, we're going to go straight on to the questions. And we've got Nikki and Gus uh, fielding those for us. I can't see any in my screen, I'm afraid. Yeah, I do. I've got the two linked questions here. I'm on, which is a major challenge is looking much effectively at the pandemic with a simultaneous introduction. You're, you're very blurred. S slow down and start again. Sorry, it's very Sorry. difficult to hear you. The, the, the major challenge in looking retrospectively at the pandemic is a simultaneous introduction of multiple measures. Um, what progress is can you expect for pinpointing the efficacy of specific MPIs? And the second one is MPIs are often announced on a single day, but actually the behaviour change happens sort of around that period. And I wonder if you, know, you could give some views on that. Well, I think this is a question for you, Adam. Do you, did you hear that all right? I did, yes. Um, yeah. I think that's a, a really good point. I, mean, I, I suspect we're going to be having debates around exactly what happened in March for decades, just because so much happened at, at such a uh, now period of time with such little data. Um, but really, to estimate effectiveness, having having variation is important. So the fact that I think that the countries have been lifting and reintroducing and doing things in very different ways over the autumn is giving us a lot of information. Um, but there are still some challenges. I mean. A lot of the, the measures that have come in in the UK have overlapped in, with half term, for example, with schools. So there's going to be some effect there that's that's hard to pick apart. But I think having that variation um, is going to teach us a lot more than perhaps we might be able to get out of the spring. Thanks, Adam. Next question, Gus. Any further? So next Mark? question is, I suppose, the surprising fact that September, November surge in Europe has been frequently strongest in areas where the first surge was strongest. I'm not sure that's true, but... Doesn't that suggest anything about estimates of herd immunity? And I wonder if some of the models could comment on that. I think, Gabriella, that would be a great question if you could answer that one. Uh, I, 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 herd immunity given the first waves. Yeah, so according to our models, herd immunity had not been achieved before the second wave. So it is in the in, during the second waves that we estimate herd immunity being achieved. Uh, but we think that by the end of, you know, at least in the European countries that we, we looked at, that are going through these, you know, the, these second waves, we think herd immunity will be achieved by the, you know, within the next month or two. And, 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 and of course, that doesn't mean that COVID goes away. It means it becomes seasonal. And I think it's a very important transition. And actually, if, if, if I was going to say what is, you know, for, for me, the, the, the most important known and known is how do we uh, how, how do we understand that the pandemic is over how do we know that the pandemic is over eventually there is going to be a smooth transition from pandemic phase to seasonal endemic uh, and 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 the, the way you deal with one or the other is is, is very different and 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 i think it's it's happening it, it will happen soon in some places that's great. Mark, do you want to pick up on that? Because it sort of segues into the whole question of do we need a vaccine and uh, the implications, but these are part of the known unknowns, I guess, about ongoing transmission and immunity. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think we will be able to distinguish between the different estimates of herd immunity thresholds after uh, after this wave, probably because, as Gabriella says, it's it's a uh, this should be it under the lower threshold and uh, and transition to seasonality. And um, uh, I think it will be a little challenging because uh, 
it's also very tied up with the amount of with the duration of immunity. Um, uh, so I think it will be it will be not totally obvious, but but we will have much better ability to truly distinguish the the two uh, poles. And probably my view is that the the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Um, that it's that there is clearly an effect of heterogeneity and and herd immunity on the whole herd immunity threshold, but that it's uh, less dramatic than than um, those estimates that Gabriella showed. But but these are all hypotheses now, and data will data will hopefully be able to distinguish among them. Thank you, Mark. Um, any other questions, Gus and Nikki? Uh, the, the final one, I suppose, which is quite popular, was about school closure. Um, and the effect of that, which I think is, and someone's talking about, there's been lots of discussion in the States, but perhaps less discussion in the UK, and perhaps some comments on that. Uh, Adam, that's a non-pharmaceutical intervention. How do you feel about answering that one? Well, and everybody can jump in if they would like. Yeah, I mean, I think um, even from quite early on, you know, children clearly had a very different profile of, um, of severity and perhaps susceptibility to, to what we might expect for something like flu. Um, and I think the implications of school closures very much depend on what you assume about their role in transmission. Um, I think now we've got a kind of clear idea that probably a primary school child is not the same as you know, someone at university or, or an older school child. And I think we've seen that increasingly reflected in policies that some countries that have got younger groups back to school have perhaps been able to do so more easily than having older groups um, but of course then it depends on what's going on in the background in the community I think one of the big challenges if you've got a lot of community transmission you will see cases among school age groups regardless of whether or not schools are actually amplifying the outbreak. Does that yeah, help? Thank maybe you. I could add I think I think I agree with all of that and I think the the epidemiologic data for lower susceptibility of children under 10 is pretty compelling um, uh, and uh, despite many challenges in gathering those data and uncertainties in its interpretation, I think the consistency of that finding is pretty strong. Um, and, uh, and I'll just say, I think there's a huge social fact component to this as well, because closing schools doesn't mean that children go home and live in a bubble. Uh, they go home and either socialize with their friends or they transmit if they have it to their parents or, or, or the like. So I think um, this is not meant to take one side or the other, but only to say that, um, you know, some, some politicians that I've talked to have said uh, that their view is that having people in a structured environment where they're being watched is more likely to control transmission uh, than having them uh, you know, in an uncontrolled environment. And so I think I, I'm not saying that's right, right or wrong, just to say that I think um, seeing it as not just children versus adults and, um, uh, and crowded versus not, but also as sort of a behavioral issue is probably an important piece of it. Thank you, Mark. I, I'm itching to ask you one question. Um, um, maybe every, Gabriella and Mark. Um, our government, subject to regulatory approval, is getting ready to roll out hundreds of millions of vials of vaccine. They're saying as early in the next two weeks. What, what's your view on that? And um, given what we're saying about the second phase at the moment and immunity being established in Gabriella's mind, uh, perhaps. And so I'd like your view on that. Is this the right approach as a public health approach at the moment? Because that's the big question that everybody would be asking. Gabriel. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I tried to show very quickly at the end that, that heterogeneity may have implications for deciding how many doses you need and, and what, what percentage of the population you should have vaccinate to prevent uh, the, uh, suffering and death and, and, and in waves. Um, so, and, and 
if, if we have a correlation, if we have that correlation between susceptibility to infection and vulnerability, that, that we, with one strategy, you, you, could, you could have two benefits. So, so if, if you try target the vulnerable, you would also be targeting those who would be more likely to be infected. And that could be, that would be very efficient. So I think it would be important to, to, to test that. The, uh, because if it's true that you won't need more than 20% of the population to be effectively uh, protected by the vaccine to prevent major outbreaks or major epidemics in the years coming forward, then uh, then you, you don't need to just you you can you can not do a better distribution you know, among worldwide. You, you don't need one country to if you don't need any country to have more than twenty percent of those other countries can have it and you can have a more uh, equal distribution somehow. So I think these considerations will be important. There heterogeneity considerations will be important to decide about vaccine as well, vaccine distributions as well. Thank you. Mark, just very quickly, do you want yeah. to add? I mean, I, I disagree with that last point in the sense that most of the heterogeneity is unobserved, or much of it is unobserved, so I think it's not so simple. But but my, my broader thought is, uh, I'm also surprised to hear it's hundreds of millions of doses now in the UK in the sense that I thought we had made America greedy again and we're the greediest country, and even we are talking about sort of 10% of our population the, but the media has said 100 million doses they've pre-purchased. Yeah. But I, yeah. Right, but that's, I don't think that's all people. now. Yeah. That's not all now. Um, so uh, I think, I mean, I don't know the UK situation, but uh, my guess is that it will be gradual. But um, my, my concern is that uh, we really don't know the long-term efficacy of the vaccines, um, and we would expect that the efficacy might be a little bit or even substantially higher in the first month or two after vaccination, might not be, but but we need to know that. Um, and so I'm 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 all for rolling out vaccine, especially to the most uh, high risk people, as quickly as it can be rolled out safely. Uh, or uh, and and but my concern is that we really do need longer term follow up of the maybe lower risk people in the trials. Um, and Adam mentioned vaccinating the placebo recipients. I think that would be a huge mistake, um, ethically unnecessary and, um, and scientifically destructive of the value of the trials. So I hope that, um, although the momentum seems to be in that direction, I hope that it, at least for some vaccines, will get some data on the longer term safety and efficacy. Thank you. This has been a fabulous session and uh, I've been a bit greedy because I've stolen two or three minutes. So I'm going to hand over to Phil now, but thank you to all our speakers. I know there's going to be lots of questions, but this was a brilliant, um, brilliant session, really informative. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alison. We now have a break. It was well, going to be 15 minutes. It's now about 11 minutes, uh, but we're starting back for our final session at 3.15. We're going to be talking about regional responses from Sweden, Africa, Norway and France. Uh, and then our final session, we're talking about the media communication of the science and all that uncertainty. So join us back here at 3.15. Thank you.